TV production for this program was provided by Capstone Productions, Inc. and EPHistory.com, the website for TV documentaries on DVD, and information about our webcast and radio broadcasts about El Paso history and heritage. This program is made possible in part by a grant from the El Paso County Historical Commission. Bernie Sargent, Chairman. Thank you for watching. I've had the privilege for uh, a number of years now to be involved with the El Paso County Historical Commission. And for the past umpteen years, I've been the chairman, which uh, has been an honor for, for me to be able to serve in that capacity. But in that capacity, I've had the, uh, the opportunity to meet a couple of very, very uh, genuine and interesting individuals who have resided as the executive uh, directors of the Texas Historical Commission. And a few years ago, this gentleman here moved uh, from... Colorado or is it Deadwood, Colorado? Yeah, a stellar background. <laughs> Moved from Colorado to Austin, Texas to take the position and it's been a privilege and an honor to know him and call him a friend, uh, both uh, with regards to history as well as outside of his capacity as executive director. So without further ado, I want to introduce uh, our executive director from Austin, Texas, Mark Wolf. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bernie, and, and and I am the executive director, not the chairman. It says chairman in the in the brochure, and there are two differences. The the chairman is appointed by the governor. He runs the commission, and he is my boss. And the other difference is he's a volunteer, and I get a paycheck. So I would much rather be the executive director than the chairman any day. And and uh, it's completely accurate. I am Mark Wolf, and uh, I am not Don Ripkema. And I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Don Ripkema, but I will tell you, um, although I'm happy to be here today and to talk to you about uh, economic issues related to historic preservation, if you had wanted an economist, you would have invited Don Ripkema because that's what he does. Don's company is called Place Economics. He, uh, uh, this is basically what he does. He travels around the country and he talks about the economics of historic preservation. Uh, he's probably been in El Paso before, I don't know. He was in Austin back in November and I went and listened to him, so although he's not here, and uh, that's him, well he's kind of here, but just his picture. So although he's not here, a lot of what you're going to hear from me related economics is going to be what I have heard from Don over the years. I've known him for a very long time. And so uh, credit for all the good things, go to Don. If there are mistakes made, they're mine, I assure you. But uh, at the very end, I'm going to give you a link to a report that he wrote that has in it links to every economic benefits of historic preservation study done in any state up until about November, October, November of last year. So I, I think uh, you'll find that very helpful and most of the numbers I'm gonna use uh, come from there. And Bernie said something about Deadwood. I was the first historic preservation officer for the city of Deadwood, South Dakota. And just down the street, from our city hall was Eddie's Tire and Glass, and Eddie's Tire and Glass was owned by Eddie Ripkema, who happened to be Don's uncle. Has nothing to do with what I'm talking about today, but it's a small world. So I, I know the purpose of your uh, summit here is to increase awareness of the value of heritage tourism for El Paso. That's a very important thing to do. Heritage tourism is certainly a significant economic generator, and, and I will cover that, but you know, because I'm not an economist, when I hear the word value, I think of things beyond dollar value. So uh, I think if all we do as preservationists is talk about the money that can be made from preservation one way or another, if that's the only thing we do, we're doing uh, ourselves and others a real disservice. Because, uh, you know, if I tell you for every dollar that's spent on historic preservation, you make $6 or $7 or $8, somebody will come in behind me and say, if you have a lettuce packing plant, you can make $9 or $10 or 11 It doesn't do anybody any good because then it's really only about how much money can you make off of it and how, how, what's your return on investment. It's important to talk about return on investment with historic preservation, and we have great numbers to share. I just want to make sure you all understand, as far as I'm concerned, it's a lot more than that. If that's all it was, I don't think it'd be worth doing. It's worth a lot more than that. So 
here is what I'm planning to do. I'm going to uh, give you the economic information that I promised and that I think you were hoping for, and then I'm going to go beyond that a little bit and talk about other ways in which uh, preservation enriches our lives. And I'll give you 15. There are a lot more than that, but I figured I had time for 15, so I'll do that. And then uh, in order to keep you awake to the end, one of the things I'm going to do at the end is give you maybe a new way of thinking about why uh, historic preservation should be important to us, and it has to do with movies. So, But we'll start with the economics, because that's really where uh, this all begins. Heritage tourism, number one. Preservation does bring heritage travelers to town. It's been some years ago now uh, since I left Colorado, but uh, before I left, we were involved in some planning studies with the Colorado Tourism Office, and they had this great relationship with a company called Longwoods International. Longwoods does a lot of tourism uh, survey kinds of work, and our agency, the Colorado Historical Society, paid the tourism office to hire Longwoods to sort through their data and see what kind of information they could come up with relative to heritage sites. So this is, like I said, this isn't new data. This is probably more like 10-year-old data. But it's pretty amazing stuff, and it really hasn't changed much over, over time. About 38% of total pleasure trips to Colorado visited a historic site, and that accounted for about 8 million trips. 45% of the total expenditures by overnight leisure visitors to the state that same year came from that market sector. So although they're 38% of the total trips, they're 45% of the total expenditures. So it proves that in fact heritage tourists do spend more and stay longer than other tourists. And, and in fact, they calculated an average of $322 per visit. So that isn't per day, it's per visit, as opposed to the average tourist where it was $274. Most of Colorado's heritage visitors come from uh, the West, primarily California. A lot of folks from Texas, as you might know, they love Texans up there. It's all they talk about. Uh, about 45% still uh, traveled over 1,000 miles to get to their destination. They do take longer than average trips. They stay longer than other visitors. And because of that, we think they are more likely to stay in paid accommodations, heritage tourists, they have friends and family that go to visit, but they like to stay in hotels and motels more than other travelers do. And then we found uh, the last item there that only about 18% of those heritage trips were made by people who were in California. So the demographic is also a, a little interesting. Um, the average age, 46, is a little bit older than the average age of most travelers, but not by much. It's just a couple of years. 68% uh, of them were married, 47% had children at home. They do come from a somewhat higher income category with 59% earning $50,000 or more, 53% college graduates, 76% work in white collar jobs, 55% live in pretty good sized cities. And heritage travelers plan ahead more so than other visitors do. They planned their trips at least three months in advance, and they made a much greater use of the internet than other visitors did. We learned that 25% of them were using the state's official travel website, while only 15% of all travelers were using the state's website. So they definitely like to use the internet. And they'll look for information on local activities and attractions, so they're not really restricting their visitation to the specific purpose for which they came. They tend to look around when they get there and see what else is going on. They also don't use prepaid package tours very much, although I tend to think that's because the market really wasn't created for them to do that. The market is created for them to go golfing or hunting or something like that. In Colorado, usually it's more like skiing. Unfortunately, we don't ask those questions in Texas. I think that's, uh, that's too bad. Uh, we did do an economic benefits of historic preservation study uh, here in Texas back in 1999. That's the bad news. The good news is we're revising it this year, and by this time next year, we'll have all kinds of new data to share with you, but we're just now signing the contract uh, with UT and Rutgers, who are partnering on developing that report for us. So it's going to be a while before we have it. In the meantime, 
Our 99 study said that one out of 10 travelers was a heritage traveler, that they stayed longer, they spent more, $114 a day rather than $85 a day, and they were more likely to come from out of state than other travelers. I don't think Texas was counting heritage travelers the same way that other states count them. We apparently had a list and said, tell us why you came, and if it was in the top three or four, then we said, oh, you're a heritage traveler, as opposed to asking the question most states ask in their surveys, which is, when you visited our state, did you go to a heritage site? If they ask that question, I think they would get a very different answer. Um, I know that uh, uh, in, in many states, that number is considerably higher. In Florida, they said that and you would think people would go to Florida to go to the beach. I mean, that's really why people go to Florida or to Disney World, right? 46.7% of their visitors said they go to historic places. And uh, it just seems to me if we ask that question differently, we'd have a, a higher number as well. Because I think although 10% of our visitors might identify themselves as heritage travelers, when it comes right down to it, they do visit heritage sites. This is one of my favorite pictures uh, when I was working up in Colorado. This is the town of Iliff, Colorado, which no, you have never heard of. Uh, Iliff has a population, year-round population of 200. It's way up in the northeastern part of the state, and I had the great pleasure of taking a bus full of heritage tourists to Iliff. Uh, we were retracing the part of the Lincoln Highway that ran through Colorado for about 18 months. When, when the Lincoln Highway was first platted, it dropped down into uh, Colorado and then went back up into Wyoming. And after a while, they decided that was a waste of time and they cut it off and went directly uh, through from Nebraska to Wyoming and didn't bother coming back down into Colorado. So for a little while, this was part of the Lincoln Highway and the town of Iliff was on the highway. And that's, that little structure is the town pump which is still a little structure in the middle of their main intersection. I increased the population of Iliff by 35% that day, and uh, everybody had a great time, and folks in Iliff were very surprised to see how many people cared about their community. A study of international tourists to the United States showed that 4.1 million more, 4.1 million more international travelers visited a historic place then went to the beach. Four times as many international travelers went to a historic place than went to a casino or to a golf course. And yet you will find communities more than willing to spend a lot of money developing those kinds of resources for tourism and not spending their money where they could really get the greatest return on historic preservation. These international tourists spend one third more nights the heritage tourists, and they visit at least two states. And that's really important when you're Texas, because in all honesty, if you ask international tourists, their number one destination, it frequently is not Texas, but their number two destination very well might be. It's also interesting, I think, to note that although historic places are the draw for these folks, that's not where they spend their money necessarily. It's frustrating to me when I hear people say, that's a great historic property, it's really worth saving, but you know, it's not gonna pay its own way. Well, you know what, you're probably right. Statistics will show that about 7% of a heritage visitor's money during their visit will be spent at the historic site. The rest of the money gets spent on lodging and gasoline and food and other activities. And that's why historic destinations, I think, are such a great place for hotel, motel tax, and other kinds of local resources to be spent. And of course, I can't talk about heritage tourism without noting that we administer the Texas Trails program across the state. The Texas Heritage Trails program encourages travelers to visit historic and cultural attractions all over Texas, offers self-guided driving trails that give visitors an opportunity to experience the sights, sounds, and tastes that make Texas so unique. And you should check our website, which is texastimetravel.com, and that will link you to the 10 trail region websites. And if you really want to know how that all works, Beth Noble is here, and Beth is executive director of the Mountain Trail region, and she can tell you stories from the trenches that will make you realize just how important that program is for this part of our state. There's an interesting history of Western tourism. If it's something you want to get a little more information on, it's called In Search of the Golden West. 
The Tourist in Western America. And it was written by Earl S. Pomeroy back in 1957. And uh, of the typical Western tourist, he said, he never simply tours through the West. He changes the West when he looks at it, not only because he wears out the highway pavement, but because Westerners change the West into what they think he wants it to be. Because of this, Pomeroy said, they may sometimes mistreat him, offering him what he wants to see instead of what he should see, or what he should see instead of what he wants to see, and even requiring him to obey local traffic ordinances. But in the main, they welcome the first of the species each year as they welcome spring lambs and winter wheat. He himself is a crop, and he's more than that. He is a link to the rest of the world that their souls need as well as their pocketbooks. He is capital, he is income, he is market for gasoline and ice cream cones and real estate for the West itself. And I think it's important to remember that heritage tourists seek authenticity. The more you change a place to accommodate your visitors, the less likely they are to come. It doesn't mean you won't attract tourists, you just won't attract heritage tourists. It's a bit of a balancing act. So don't be too willing to make yourself into something that you aren't just to make the tourists happy. Another book, a fellow by the name of Hal Rothman, who was a professor at uh, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, wrote a book called Devil's Bargains, Tourism in the 20th Century American West. And he said, locals must be what visitors want them to be in order to feed and clothe themselves and their families. But they also must guard themselves, their souls, and their places from people who less appreciate its special traits. I believe that is definitely true. So number two, another great reason to do historic preservation, and that's because it creates and supports jobs, and not just in heritage tourism. If your city or county or state decides to spend a million dollars creating jobs, should they spend it on new construction or in historic preservation? Studies have been done around the country on this in Georgia, they showed that for every $1 million spent on historic preservation, they created 18.1 jobs. In comparison with new construction, 14.9 jobs, or computer manufacturing, four jobs, or automobile manufacturing, 3.5 jobs. Historic preservation is a great investment. In Delaware, they had similar results, 14.6 jobs created from every million dollars spent on historic preservation compared to 11.2 jobs for new construction. We did study this issue a little when we did our 1999 study, and we found that we were able to create 21.8 jobs for every million dollars invested in preservation. And the most recent study I've seen on this was the one that was done in Colorado just about a year and a half ago, and they found that for every million dollars spent on preservation in Colorado, 32 new jobs were created. Now, the reason's fairly easy to understand, really. New construction requires a lot more in the way of materials than historic preservation does. Preservation, you're pretty much working on things that are already there. But labor is very important in historic preservation. In fact, the kind of skilled labor that can work on historic materials, which means those jobs also tend to pay a little bit better than the jobs associated with new construction. So with new construction, most of your money is being spent on materials, and frankly, most of those materials are coming from outside of the area, where with preservation, most of the money is spent on labor, and most of that labor is coming from the local area. Um, see, Leslie, I had a picture of the McGoffin House up there. One of the greatest historic places in Texas, of course, the McGoffin Home, and we're all glad to know it doesn't look like that anymore. It looks fabulous. And our government knows this all to be true. The proof is in the tax code. There is a 20% income tax credit for qualified work on income-producing property that is historic. It was created at the time because the President of the United States was convinced that this kind of investment was worth making. And for those of you who think that preservation is some kind of crazy liberal scheme, and I know there's one of two of you out there that believe that, the President was Ronald Reagan. In the first 30 years of its existence, the tax credit cost the United States government over $16 billion. And it created 
1,800,000 jobs at a cost of $9,222 per job. Now, just for fun, we should compare that to the federal stimulus package, where in two years, $260.7 billion was spent, resulting in 585,684 jobs at a cost per job of $445,183. Just saying. And I should say that historic preservation was on the original list of things that the stimulus money could be spent on, and at some point it got taken off, and I'm still kind of wondering who was responsible for that, and someday we will go looking for them. Uh, in Texas, I hate to say it, we really haven't used the federal tax credit as much as we might. Last year, we only had three tax credit projects. That's how many they had in the state of Delaware. So something's just not working. But that's going to change because in 2013, the state legislature adopted a state tax credit. It's a 25% credit against the state franchise tax. And you're going to be able to use it with the state 20, with the federal 20% investment tax credit. So there is the possibility with a qualified project of getting a 45% tax credit. And that is an incentive that a lot of folks, I think, are not going to be able to walk away from. Now, we're still uh, writing the administrative rules on how this is all going to work. We just got an AG's opinion giving us some guidance. But I can promise you it's going to be a game changer. Here's a nice picture of a project that we have uh, in the works. This is the lobby of the Baker Hotel and Mineral Wells. Many of you, I imagine, are familiar with it. This is a project the developers just kept looking at and shaking their heads and going back to the calculators and then looking at it again and calling us. And it goes back and forth for years. And now they're saying, we can do this project. It's going to happen. And that's just one of many projects around the state that we're getting calls about. Number three. Preservation supports property values. Historically designated properties maintain their values better than properties that are not historically designated. So that's another way that preservation helps the economy. Our study back in 99 said that designated properties in Texas communities saw an increase in value of between 5 and 20 percent. In Philadelphia, they did a study and said their designated properties were worth 14.3 percent more than comparable properties that just hadn't been designated yet. In the seven year, uh, no, Louisville. Louisville, Kentucky designated property values increased in value by 21% more than non-designated properties over the same seven year period. And these were comparable properties, some of them designated historic districts and some outside of and even near designated historic districts. We did look at this when we did our plans in Colorado in 2002. We updated it in 2005. They've updated it since then in 2011. And they found that designation at very least stabilized the property values and in most cases gave them a boost. And in not a single case in any of these studies has anyone been able to show that designated designation resulted in any kind of a reduction in property values. I hear that from people all the time. It just isn't true. And of course, higher property values means better tax revenue opportunities for your local governments. Another interesting impact or effect of this has to do with foreclosures. Studies in several communities around the country have shown that foreclosure rates are lower in historic districts than they are outside of historic districts. And we like to think that's because people who live in historic districts are just better off financially, but that isn't the case. We think the reason for this is the fact that because their property values are stable, more stable than other property values, that when things start going a little upside down, they're able to sell their properties and not take a loss and move on. So we're not really sure of the, of the exact cause of it, but the effect is pretty clear. Number four, downtown development. Preservation supports downtown commercial development. Our uh, agency's been administering the Main Street program since 1981, one of the first in the nation. And although we do focus that program on downtown redevelopment, it's definitely through the filter of historic preservation. We, uh, we currently work with about 87 communities. Some are urban, most are rural, some are big, most are small, uh, and they're all over the state. 
And since 1981, we've seen nearly 7,500 new businesses start in Main Street communities. They've invested more than $2.6 billion, creating 28,729 jobs. The reinvestment ratio in Texas from the planning that we've done, the studies that we've done is 16 to one. So for every dollar invested in a Main Street community by the local government, $16 is invested by the property owners. It's such a successful program that our partners at the Department of Agriculture target some of their CDBG funds towards Main Street communities. Those communities actually get a slice of CDBG money. Uh, and it's a project that the governor's office has also been very supportive of. The First Lady, uh, every year since this program was created, has gone uh, with us to visit all of the newly designated Main Street communities every year. And so on uh, Thursday, this coming Thursday, uh, Ms. Perry will be going with us out to see Waco, Sealy, and Caldwell, the three communities that we just designated uh, earlier this year. And by the way, that will make 49 communities that she visited for us in her term as the First Lady. Number five, preservation is great for the environment. This is where my friend Donovan, if he were here, would say the Sierra Club and the Tea Party should be holding hands. The city of New York did an energy audit of all the city's buildings and they found the buildings with the lowest energy usage were those that were built before 1930. Those buildings were not built to depend on mechanical systems alone. They have higher ceilings, they have transom windows for ventilation, they have fans sometimes instead of just air conditioners. They have materials, they're made of materials that work better with their climate than most newer buildings. They have window awnings that can be raised or lowered as they're needed, a lot of different reasons why that's the case. And it's even more true really with residential buildings. If you look at historic homes, uh, again, high ceilings, storm windows, mature landscaping that provides protection from the weather. Um, they're more, they can be made more energy efficient, but they are already more energy efficient than most newer buildings. But instead of saving these buildings, and making them even more energy efficient. There's a focus on tearing them down so that we can build what we then call green buildings. And I think that's sort of a, a misnomer. When you build a new building, first of all, you have to obtain the raw material. Then that uses a lot of energy. Then you have to transport it someplace. Then you have to turn it into the thing you want it to be. Then you have to transport it again. And then you have to put it where you want it. And all of those things take energy. So depending on the size of a new building that you decide to build and what kind of materials you're using, it's estimated it will take you anywhere from 10 to 80 years to make up for the energy that you used in building the building itself. If you demolish an existing building to build a new building, it's even worse. It'll take at least 35 years to save the amount of energy that you just used. Uh, someone was curious enough about this to do a, an interesting calculation and measure the amount of waste that was coming out of construction and restoration projects. And they found that over four times more waste results from a new construction project than from the same size project that's a rehabilitation. If you tear down a building to build a new building, it's seven times more waste. We all try to be more conservation conscious. It's the right thing to do. Uh, a lot of us recycle our aluminum cans. Some of us don't have any choice but to recycle our aluminum cans. But uh, all the same, there are a lot of people who wouldn't think of throwing a can away, but they will sometimes advocate for a building to be demolished. And they did a study in Hartford, Connecticut. There was a big old building they were going to tear down. Finally, they ended up saving it and turning it into housing. And somebody went back and did the calculations. And they said, you know, if we had torn that building down, it would have been equivalent to throwing away 21 million aluminum cans, equivalent to 616,000 gallons of gasoline. So as you can see on the screen, saving one typical downtown commercial building is estimated as being equivalent to recycling nearly 1.5 million aluminum cans. And the same people who advocate against the use of plastic grocery bags will tell you you should use vinyl windows. Well, um, sorry to say that first generation vinyl windows are already headed to the landfill, as you can see here. Uh, we like to say they call them replacement windows because they have to be replaced fairly regularly. Some of them can be recycled, and that's great, but how many of them are just going out to the landfill? 
um, his saving historic buildings, using them for modern purposes, making them more energy efficient is the way to go. And a wooden window, I promise you, will last a lot longer than a vinyl window ever will. So number six, and now we're getting a little further from economics, heading into some culture and social territory here. Uh, historic places connect us to our heritage in a very tangible way. They help us to remember who we are, how we got here, more so, I think, than pictures and stories and artifacts, which are all very, very important things, and they contribute to the story, but nothing really substitutes for being in the place where something happened. I don't know, most of you might recognize this particular place, although it's a bit of a close-up. This is the sixth floor of the Dallas Book Depository. Now, some of you just got chills. Now, imagine if looking at a picture can do that to you, standing in the place, looking up at that building, thinking about what happened that day. The impact that that has compared to looking at a picture is phenomenal. And if that's phenomenal, then try this view. You can go up there now. You can see pretty much through the window that Oswald was looking through that day. There isn't anything that is the same as experiencing the place itself. Hey. Oh, sorry. I, I did live in South Dakota for a few years, so I know a little bit about throwing. Okay, number seven. Historic places teach us about the diversity of cultures in our country, and that's why we had the drum start. Places reflect the people who live in those places. We sometimes hear that designating historic neighborhoods results in displacing people from their neighborhoods, and that's not true. That's been studied in detail as well, and found, in fact, that historic neighborhoods are just as diverse ethnically and economically as comparable neighborhoods that weren't designated. A couple of interesting examples, I think. This uh, little house up in the uh, left-hand corner, it did go there eventually, didn't it? It just takes a minute. There it is. So this little house, this is the Odom House in Newton County out in East Texas. We recently put this house on the National Register of Historic Places. Doesn't look like much, does it? Well, this is the Odom family home, and it was really based on the importance of that family in their neighborhood. This one family absolutely insisted that African-American children have educational opportunities that otherwise would not have been available to them. They converted their pickup into a school bus. They made sure that every kid in that neighborhood got to school every day. They had public meetings in their living rooms. I mean, they really pushed the issue. They even got a teacher's college started in this amazing part of rural East Texas. So. And you go to this neighborhood, and there's not much here, and you see this house, and you get a chance to talk to the people in the neighborhood, that will tell you more about African American history in Texas than just about anything. Or uh, the lower right hand photograph is the Minidoka Relocation Center outside of Boise, Idaho, where some of the uh, uh, Japanese folks were uh, interned during World War II. And there are still some structures left, and it's a, a really interesting place to see and learn a lot about our, in some cases, shared and in other ways very different uh, cultural heritage. Number eight, historic places give us a sense of place. And you can debate what that means and whether or not it's even a tangible concept, but I like to think that it means that when you get someplace, you know that that's where you are. There's a book called The Geography of Nowhere by James Kunstler, been around for a lot of years now, and he says, we know not where we come from, still less where we are going, and to keep from going crazy while we're here, we want to feel that we truly belong to a specific part of the world. That makes a lot of sense to me. This is Waits River, Vermont. As soon as you saw the picture, you knew it was someplace in New England. It's one of those places that really has that sense of place. Number nine, historic places can protect local character and lifestyle. And they can prevent us from a homogenization that happens in communities otherwise, uh, simply by virtue of the fact that we're part of a global economy. 
there's always a temptation to make one place look like another, especially if that other place is economically successful. People say, wow, well, that works for them. Maybe we can do that too. And they change themselves sometimes into something that they, they shouldn't be. Preservation of what you have can protect local character. This is uh, Virginia City, Nevada, in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, a couple of uh, fake Virginia cities and other places, and the absolute worst one I've ever seen in my life in the lower right-hand corner, it's an old west town made up of storage units uh, outside of Custer, South Dakota. Number 10, I think we save historic places because things are changing around us so much and it really helps to ground us. Uh, it, it, it's great to be able to sort of hold on to something and say, I know this place for what it is, and it's, it's been part of me for a long time. Now, uh, this idea is so important to us that we actually will sometimes change our memories to meet the place that we've saved. And I think this is sort of an interesting example from my own uh, childhood. I'm originally from Oregon, uh, out on the West Coast, logging, really big part of the economy and not so much anymore. We used to have what were called wigwam burners. I don't know if you've ever seen these kinds of things around here, but uh, this is where wood waste got burned off. Every mill had at least one of them and sometimes two or three or four. And whatever was left at the end of the day just went in there and they lit it on fire and, and uh, burned it off. So they were horrible. They were just horrible. They were just billowing smoke all the time, dirty, stinky. Pl you could smell them for miles. You could see the smoke up in the sky. All of that went away in the late 60s. They started tearing them all down. There aren't very many of them left now. They're real landmarks, and they've sort of developed this beauty, this pastoral <laughs> beauty that they didn't have originally. And that's grass growing around them. You go in the art galleries over at the coast and there will be these paintings of wigwam burners and I kind of get a kick out of it. But it's really because people need that. You know, they need that anchor, that thing that they can hold on to that hasn't changed. And even if they change the way they think about them, that still it's such an important place that they just can't help themselves. Preservation helps to reflect local values. People get pride of place from what's been saved and its impact on the landscape. When you see a place like this and it's cared for the way this place is cared for, then it says a lot about the people who live there. And when the people who live there see this place every single day of their lives, they have an emotional reaction to it. And I would say I've, I've had a blessed career. I've been able to be involved in a lot of, in saving a lot of historic places around the country in my life. And, and I, whenever I see any of them, I feel this wonderful feeling. And I know local preservation is here that works so hard. I know that you all feel that way, but I think everybody feels that. Even if you didn't have a hand necessarily in saving it, when you go buy it, you know it got saved and, and you're there to experience it every day. And knowing that it's going to survive you, I think even uh, just gives people a, a, a great uh, respect. And really, I think that reflects the values of your community. Number 12, the reuse of historic properties can help to prevent sprawl by focusing development into areas where the necessary infrastructure is already in place. I'm guilty here. I will be the first to admit I live in a place that doesn't probably look all that different from this picture from the air. I moved to Austin after the real estate boom. There wasn't any way I could live in a historic neighborhood because anything that's close into downtown, the value just got crazy. And I got three or four times more square footage for the same price by living out in the suburbs. That's what attracts people out there. But then I ask, you know, in terms of paying taxes and stuff, who's costing the city more, me or the people who are living downtown? Well, the people who live downtown, their kids can walk to school, they can ride their bike to work, they can go to the grocery store pretty easily. You know, for me, wherever I go, it's a trip in the car. To build my house, they had to extend utilities, so water line, sewer line, electrical. They have to try to extend the bus lines down there, although in Austin they haven't ever quite gotten around to doing that. They had to build new schools. They had to build new fire stations. I cost the city of Austin an awful lot more than somebody who lives in one of those wonderful historic neighborhoods. It's hard sometimes for communities to realize where the value really is. Number 13, there's an aesthetic reason to preserve things. I'm not going to go into that. You know why? Because what you think is beautiful and what I think is beautiful are not the same, probably. 
I love signs like this. Some people don't. I think it's a wonderful thing. But to prove to you, not only do you have a different opinion sitting in this room, but over time we change our opinions with aesthetics. Tell me, who is more beautiful? Miss America 1926 or Miss Texas 2013? See, I just lost all the women in the room. Okay, okay, so here's one for you. Who is more handsome, Rudolph Valentino, whose death in 1926 resulted in female fans throwing themselves out of windows, or Brad Pitt? Okay, so there's also a cultural aspect to this. Uh, different places in the world will think beauty is different things. Number 14. Preservation promotes respect for those who came before us. The older I get, the more I think that young kids today don't have any respect for their elders. And, uh, and they're also not all that smart in all honesty. Sometimes I saw a survey that uh, college graduates could not identify George Washington as the leader of the colonial forces at Yorktown and didn't know that the Battle of the Bulge was fought during World War II. So there's a problem there. But if you really want young people to appreciate the past and appreciate their elders, then you have to not do things like this. This was the Seneca County, Ohio courthouse. It's a miniature version of the Texas Capitol. It was designed by the same architect and it was demolished two years ago because they decided they couldn't afford to fix it up. And there was an outcry from all over the country about this and they said, you know, it's all about money and that building is lost. And I would say young people in that community have very little respect for their elders. And finally, number 15, historic preservation has value because architecture is an art and history is a story. And if you take art and story and you put them together, you have something that's equivalent to a great movie, a wonderful song, or a fabulous book. For centuries, architecture has been referred to as frozen music. And my graduate program director, Chester Liebs, wrote Main Street to Miracle Mile, and he used to refer to what we see through the windshield as we drive down the street as the movie through the windshield, and the signs and structures that we see are like the movie's cast. And that movie is a part of our culture every bit as much as these movies. There are lines in these movies that most of us know. There are performances that we value. The movie at some point transcends personal property, and it belongs to all of us in some way, and our communities, our neighborhoods, our streetscapes are like these movies. When you tear down a building, it's like tearing a page out of a book, it's like taking a line out of a song, it's like eliminating a performance from a movie. But editing is a very specialized skill and not something that should be undertaken lightly. Otherwise, you end up with something like this. Colorized films. They even colorized Psycho. They had color film in 1960 when Hitchcock made Psycho. By the way, he chose not to use it, but you can now watch it in color, and that's what I mean by people making bad editing decisions. What can you lose when you edit indiscriminately? How much can you lose before people realize it's gone? Well, imagine Psycho without the shower scene, or Gone with the Wind without the closing line, or Wolf of Wall Street without Matthew McConaughey. If you didn't see it before, you might not know it's not there, but you would still be missing something significant, and I think we have a duty to make sure that that kind of thing doesn't happen, to make sure that we take whatever steps are necessary to ensure that we don't lose something that is so important, so significant, that its loss will be felt for generations. So that was 15. That's it from me. I hope you all continue to share in what novelist Don Delilo in his book White Noise calls the religious experience of tourism. Uh, thank you for inviting me and here's the link I promised you. Uh, this will give you a report written by Don Ripkema and on page 71 of this report you'll find the beginning of a list of every economic benefits study known to man. So, thank you. Before we let him escape, are there any questions for uh, Mr. Wolf? Great. Mark, thank you so very, very much. I think that uh, it would uh, be a great opportunity for us to present that talk to every single elected official so that they understand the uh, repercussions of throwing away our history and our heritage.
TV production for this program was provided by Capstone Productions, Inc. and EPHistory.com, the website for TV documentaries on DVD and information about our webcast and radio broadcasts about El Paso history and heritage. This program is made possible in part by a grant from the El Paso County Historical Commission. Bernie Sargent, Chairman. Thank you for watching.